Good afternoon. Welcome to this month's uh, Insolvent IP webinar delivered to you by Metis Partners. This is This is our special edition dedicated to intellectual property assets in insolvency, specifically tailored to uh, scenarios um, which are typical for the publishing sector. The speaker today for you is me. My name is Eileen. For those of you who don't know me, I'm part of the corporate recovery team and I primarily focus on IP valuation work, but uh, I have significant experience in running IP asset sales exercises as well. And I would like to share my uh, recent experience dealing with companies uh, in the publishing sector, um, which um, uh, has given me a good insight into what's typical, what's interesting, and what to look out for uh, in these scenarios. Uh, I'd, I would just like to start off with recapping on who we are and what we do in general. Uh, for those of you who don't know METIS or haven't come across our work before, we're an intellectual property valuation firm with a proven track record in the assessment, exploitation, monetization, valuation and sale of IP assets. We're headquartered in Glasgow, however, we do work with clients across the UK uh, and also with North American, European and Asian experience. We have uh, heavily focused on our European growth uh, recently and in terms of the team, uh, we are a growing multidisciplinary team. Uh, our members have a background in uh, accounting, law, finance, uh, humanities, which provides a good mix of experience and expertise uh, for the different uh, cases that we deal with. Uh, what's important to highlight here is that the corporate recovery team provides commercial practical advice on how to deal with IP and insolvency or distress scenarios. However, we're not lawyers and we often work alongside lawyers to assist insolvency practitioners with the cases that they have. Uh, we take a commercial approach and try to provide commercial solutions to IP issues in insolvency. Uh, we're also hiring to try and uh, expand our presence and um, our scope uh, and um, our website has more information on that for those of you who are curious to see uh, what's happening uh, in the Metis world these days. In terms of today's webinar, uh, the topics that we will be discussing uh, are quite standard, uh, quite uh, similar to the different niche sectors that we're covering in, in the series for, for the autumn series of the Metis webinars. What we will be f uh, focusing on specifically is newspaper and periodical publishing, especially having working, worked on a number of cases in the space over the last uh, couple of years. Uh, and some of our observations, however, would be relevant to other branches of the publishing space as well. And we will touch upon the dynamics between moving from print to digital publishing and how IP uh, might work out there and what the implications may be. We will look at the typical IP assets in the sector. Uh, we will see what, what, which of them are critical, which of them tend to suggest that there's more value than others. Uh, we'll, we'll have a quick poll as well, just to get uh, your thinking juices running. Uh, and we'll go through the sector specific IP considerations and value preservation uh, suggestions to uh, try and understand the action points that could be uh, relevant to make sure that value is preserved and maximized in insolvency. And we'll um, also uh, present a, a couple of case studies from our experience to make sure that um, we um, understand, we all understand, we're all on the same page on what interesting things can crop up in these types of scenarios. And we'll wrap up with the key takeaways, uh, hopefully to give you some ideas on what to do with your next case. Just to start off with the basics uh, and to, to think about the typical IP assets in the publishing sector from our experience. Um, First off, brands and trademarks. Um, this is always the type of thing that usually is more, most prominent in these types of businesses. The, the brand or the name of the magazine uh, tends to come before even the content. What's, what's on the cover tends to grab the attention and tends to be remembered the most. 
obviously copyrights and quite a few different implications, particularly around ownership, will touch upon those as well. Things like design work and more and more software and data, uh, even the publishing world uh, can't ex escape the, the new developments in uh, the business world in general and keeps up by um, making sure that uh, the technology and the data and marketing approaches they take are relevant and interesting. Before I start and go into the different types of IP asset classes to think about the different implications and specifics, I would like to uh, suggest that we look at the poll that we've prepared for you today. And just to get you thinking a bit more about it. What uh, we were looking for today is uh, some thoughts on which of the three magazine sectors uh, account for the highest revenue within the print retail magazine market. And we've got news and current affairs, TV listings, leisure interests. Um, just to think about it, we will be talking about market context and the business context further down the line in this webinar. Um, so it would be interesting to see what you think are um, the most revenue generating uh, segments of the sector. And I will give you another 10-15 um, seconds just to, to wrap up at a minute and we'll see um, where we are in, in terms of your thoughts on which sector is accounts for the highest revenues. And just wrapping up, another five seconds. And that's it. Um, interesting results there. Uh, I think about 36% of you have gone for news and current affairs, 0% uh, for TV listings, and 64% for leisure interests. Uh, you will be surprised to know, uh, according to a Statista um, uh, research, uh, piece, uh, TV listings is actually the, the, the largest segment at 20.9%, uh, whilst news and current affairs accounts for 1.9% of revenues and leisure interest publications account for 4.4% of revenues. Um, definitely an interesting one and uh, quite provo thought provoking in terms of um, what, what may have value, what may be attractive, what may be interesting in, in this sector. Now, moving on to our next section, let's go through the different IP basics and to see what the key IP assets are in the sector and what we should be thinking about when we deal with these types of assets. First of all, brands and trademarks. As we discussed, um, it's important to understand that the brand is quite key for revenue generation uh, purposes. They are the names and symbols which instill trust, identity, and empathy with a specific business, the product, or its services. Uh, and the brand is probably what would make readers go back to the same publications again and again. Um, it's quite interesting that uh, a lot of players in that, sp in that space also have uh, event-related sub-brands. So they tend to be behind different awards, seminars, conferences organized, and this tends to add a significant amount of value to the, to the overall corporate brand, but also creates a good basis for creation of sub-brands, which are also attractive uh, when it comes to marketing them and looking for uh, interested parties and um, revenue, uh, return on uh, revenues in insolvency. It's quite important uh, to under understand that the corporate brand and the sub-brands and these types of event-related sub-brands could be quite uh, autonomous and sometimes could be sold independently uh, in order to provide or maximize uh, returns to creditors. Um, the long-standing uh, events, for example, may be attractive to different event organizers, although they, they may not be publishers as such. So trying to take a wider look on what's, what's interesting and what's attractive is quite important. 
And obviously, trademark registration, uh, registered trademarks, um, goes back to our, some of our IP basics editions before, but registered trademarks with the R symbol next to them, unregistered trademarks with the TM uh, symbol next to them, um, could add significant value to, to the brand. And it's quite important to have these um, recognized and identified early on, or if uh, these are lacking, it's, it's an issue that should be flagged up early on as well in case any spurious registrations crop up in the register uh, by being filed by third parties uh, unrelated to that business specifically. Next off, copyright. And that's probably the, the biggest point and the biggest topic that we always have to look into when we're dealing with publishing. Uh, and copyright pretty much applies to any original work that has been created for the purposes of publishing it, either digitally or on paper. And it's re re uh, related to literary works uh, and photographic work primarily in the publishing space, but it genu genuinely relates to uh, all kinds of assets, uh, including databases, for example, uh, whilst the, uh, the, the data in itself and the information held uh, on that database is a different type of an asset. It also is protected by copyright. The way the, the, that database is um, managed and formatted and sorted is also protected by copyright. Um, in terms of content and copyright in in um, in publishing work specifically the move from print to digital and the life that um, a creation in print sometimes takes up in in digital format could be quite significant it becomes more and more relevant with with the modern ways of information dissemination and um, it's quite important uh, to understand whether a business has managed to catch up with the new uh, ways of disseminating information and the creation of the digital rights. Um, as for an, a, an interesting example is, for example, whether um, J.K. Rowling, when writing uh, the Harry Potter books, uh, which are a piece of literary work, uh, primarily for paper dissemination, um, has envisaged that things like Hogwarts and um, the names of the different characters, um, the names of the different locations would grow up to become brands of their own and uh, will create all uh, sorts of hosts of rights around those as well. Uh, so it's more, more the branching out of assets uh, rights and the future legal no ownership of those, whether that's been envisaged by a company when creating uh, or when creating or publishing an article in a publication, uh, that would create future sub-brands or interesting um, uh, characters or brands and product uh, uh, implications for future. That's uh, important to look into, uh, especially from the point of view of the generation of future rights and future revenues. In terms of the copyright ownership, uh, an issue that um, is quite prominent and we, we get involved in trying to clarify further down the line when we get cases uh, is obviously ownership. Uh, and it largely depends on the authors and whether the authors were employees of the company or whether they were freelancers who created the uh, content, the photographic work or the articles. Um, on such a basis and the key point at that stage becomes checking the agreements for these, the, any licenses that have been created, um, any ownership documentation of some sort uh, as it becomes quite uh, difficult uh, once a company uh, goes in insolvency uh, to try and understand who owns the rights to these types of things if they haven't been understood early on. But it is the case that sometimes companies that appear to have a huge amount of IP uh, end up not having that much uh, in terms of ownership of the, the content that has been published through different magazines or various kinds of publications and special publications as well. Uh, so definitely one of the first questions to ask is what um, I would kind of flag it up as. 
our next uh, IP asset class, design work. Uh, and whilst when we talk about copyright, we talk about the content itself. With design work, we think we, we should be thinking about the look and feel of the publication, uh, the layout, uh, any specific uh, typical layout uh, solutions that have been created and the, the publication is known for. Uh, things like templated uh, content or sometimes uh, some, some uh, businesses uh, that publish magazines um, tend to do bespoke layouts for each issue. Um, and it's quite interesting, ownership status again is dependent on the creator. If the designer team is internal and their contracts do have provisions around the work that they've done uh, being owned by the company, chances are the design work would be um, something that could be sold as an asset of the company. Uh, whilst if that type of uh, service has been provided externally or if uh, there's been software that has been licensed in uh, that has assisted in that, um, it becomes more of a gray area that should be considered in the course of the insolvency process as well. Our next IP asset class, software, uh, it is becoming increasingly relevant in the move from print to digital. Um, most commonly, the way we see it in the publishing sector is around web and app-based electronic versions of the publications, some more sophisticated than others. Uh, however, uh, always in some shape or form, they seem to exist in the most relevant businesses uh, that the most successful publishing businesses that we've seen. Actually, that seems to be the almost the main criteria as to whether um, a business has got significant potential or not being able to trans transition to that digital uh, content and format uh, solution. Another way software could be encountered in the publishing sector is uh, for internal usage purposes, as I mentioned, for design and the production process. And again, most of the time, this means license, licensed in software. However, with some more uh, sophisticated businesses and ones that um, have uh, more elaborate uh, solutions to their day-to-day -day dealings, there might be some bespoke software that would be worth uh, looking into and might be attractive to uh, someone else in that space as well. And last but not least, data. Um, it is actually becoming more and more relevant and it's, um, it could be data relating to advertisers, partners, sub subscribers, of course, especially for uh, publications that have strong uh, web and online uh, existence. Um, and the ownership of data and having quite a bit of data to sell on to a purchaser uh, of IP and insolvency is what defines the continuity of the business and the future advertising opportunities. So um, it could be quite quite attractive. And obviously the, the type of data and usually the audience that you would have uh, on these um, databases is likely to be quite open to different um, advertising opportunities just because the publishing sector does usually lean into that type of um, of audience that's more open to new developments, more open to interesting offerings. So definitely it's the type of thing that would give v v uh, valuable behavioral insights to inform editorial decisions as well in terms of determining future content direction and uh, helping decision making uh, in uh, defining the, how a magazine or a publication would, should look and feel. So data is definitely attractive and it's, it's probably one of the important ones to uh, ask about uh, as, as early as possible following the appointment or even pre-appointment, of course, depending on the plans for, for the distressed business. And now I'll take you to, to um, our second section, which is more around the sector-specific IP considerations, whilst um, I've tried to flag up uh, issues and opportunities here and there as we were going through the different IP asset classes, um, I think there are two uh, genuine ones that uh, you've probably 
heard about more often than others in over the last few slides. One of them is ownership and um, as I mentioned it's relevant for copyright and content and design work but also for software and um, it always comes with the idea of theoretically uh, the company may own it or an external party may own it but the main thing and the other side of the coin uh, is control and being able to uh, access it in practice, being able to uh, understand and uh, see how to get into the software code if that exists or how to get access to the previous issues and editions of, of that publication or how to be able to uh, manipulate and edit the different templates and the design work that has been created for future issues. In terms of the second main consideration, um, the main point I think is value and that's the key point that all of us are uh, looking into in the insolvency space uh, prior to taking up a case and prior to understanding whether it's got uh, future opportunities to move forward. Um, users are changing their attention quickly, so understanding their positioning uh, and understanding the positioning of the publication and the offering uh, is quite key early on and um, the readership uh, add their user and their usage patterns as well. The main other thing to, to think about is um, whether they're more interested in hard copies, soft copies, um, there are specific types of reader groups that are more open to moving on to uh, soft and um, reading content in apps, uh, whilst there are specific groups that would remain kind of more inclined to read things in hard copy. But also things about embracing innovation as we discussed, things like data and software, how much uh, has the company tried to keep on top or ahead of the innovation curve? Uh, a number of the companies that we have worked with admitted that this has been their biggest shortcoming over the years and addressing market demand for more electronic content uh, and using it for revenue generation uh, could determine the value of the IP asset package in these types of businesses. And also one thing and a, a, a significant differentiator is in a market where all kinds of content is easily accessible online generating high quality and attractive content may sometimes be a key advantage. It may not be the innovation, innovative aspect of the business. It may be the high quality of the content that they've generated. So again, a factor uh, to look into and to try and identify as a USP early on. From an IP asset sale point of view in general, the extent of external dependencies, uh, as we discussed ownership in the previous slide, uh, but other external dependencies on licensing software uh, may make all the difference between selling an empty shell of some brand and magazine layouts essentially and patterns uh, and selling assets which can be easily turned into a rounded up business uh, that could be plugged into uh, another operation easily or can uh, live on independently. So from that point of view, uh, I would like you to think about all these factors and uh, it's definitely the type of the types of questions that we would ask if uh, when we are brought in on a case in order to be able to uh, identify whether it's got potential or not. And then a couple of case studies that I would like to briefly take you through um, is the first one is the hippie magazine it was one of uh, uh, one of the most favorite ones that uh, I have done in my time at Metis uh, it was uh, the biggest alternative magazine from the early 90s that we looked at at the time and it had features on health the environment social and community issues business listings event news um, the issues were downloadable via the website uh, and it had about 120,000 copies uh, generated in physical uh, format and about 2 million hits and circa 7,000 unique monthly visitors. Um, 
when we thought about the copyright, in fact, and the ownership of the copyright, um, actually turned out that copyright owned in magazine content produced in-house, such as the events and news sections, and further guides, add-on guides that they were featuring at the time. They had some festival guides uh, in their summer issues uh, and adverts uh, and um, some local images that were related to the to the area where the magazine was distributed. These were mostly the things that uh, the copyright was owned in, whilst external authors uh, had rights to their uh, to the uh, content that had, they had provided to the magazine. Uh, so from that point of view, the assets included the brand, the unregistered trademark, website, and the main names. Uh, as, as, as I mentioned, copyright in some of the content and an advertiser database. It was mostly relying on advertising database as it was a quarterly a free publication. Um, and the main thing is that when you look at the IP asset package, there isn't that much in terms of registered IP. There isn't that much even in terms of copyright. However, the positioning of the brand and uh, the sentimental uh, aspects uh, amongst the audience were quite attractive and uh, it was a very decent five-figure sum that we managed to uh, recover from that case following the sale. So the key point from that one was that chances are that not all of the content will be owned by the company and available for sale but that shouldn't be a deterrent to test the market and especially for brands which have had significant exposure and positive community sentiment uh, that could push uh, the IP asset package uh, to a considerably different level in the eyes of the purchasers. And the second case study for today is uh, an IP valuation that we did uh, a few months ago. It was a business and finance publication uh, dedicated quite and quite specialized to the commercial finance and banking sectors. And um, it was a multi-channel revenue generation uh, a setup there. The, uh, there were subscription sales, advertising revenue, revenue from events organization. Uh, they were also receiving significant royalty payments from the uh, licensing society. And they were also behind uh, some sponsored research that was bringing in uh, some more um, revenues from their point of view. So quite multifaceted and attractive. Um, there was both print and digital distribution, but focus was on print because the audience they were explaining was more inclined to read and print. However, uh, that turned into a bit of a problematic thing further down the line for them as it, it wasn't that flexible from, from the business point of view. And the company was also behind some special annual industry reviews. Um, they had a very good domain name uh, um, list in fact out of the of the general IP asset package and that was a very well protected IP asset package to be honest they had a, a main brands auxiliary brands around the events and the special publications a trademark portfolio but uh, the domain names were, um, can't say them, obviously, but they were of the caliber similar to things like financialservices.com or something like that, or business services, business finance. Uh, so attractive, uh, good domain names um, that you would see being quite interesting to purchase on the wider market. And they own the, mo the majority of their content uh, in, their cop in the copyright in that. Uh, so in terms of the, the significance of that case study, I think that's one more to illustrate the positioning of these businesses in an increasingly digitalized work uh, world. Uh, the emphasis was on print. The uh, business had Android and iOS apps, which were not actively pushed to market and revenues were not great. Uh, so the effort to build brand presence offline via events, hard copy publications, and not investing similar amounts of effort into developing the IP around the online presence uh, seemed to have uh, put the company in a difficult position eventually at the time, which is the reason why um, we were brought in to look into the IP and uh, they, were, they were taking advice around dealing with that situation in general. So this is in, in, in general terms um, what I kind of had to um, share with you today. Uh, I've got a few key takeaway points that I think are important to be, to be remembered even from 
mostly from the case studies, I think they're probably the most significant and important ones. One, one is don't be deterred by ownership issues. Uh, copyright is unlikely to be 100% owned by the company, especially if they're using some different authors to in, uh, improve the quality of their work. However, uh, that shouldn't be the, the, a stopping point and a sticking point for uh, trying to test the market and seeing what's there and what, what might the pickup be. Brand and copyright are still key in most publishing cases, so probably the first ones to be looking into and to be asking about. And then software and things like data is uh, kind of my thinking in this case. Number three, when looking into uh, selling the IP assets, think about um, what the market is and the competitive positioning of the player uh, and their influence in the sector is. Um, that's probably going to guide uh, any uh, marketing process in order to understand where the positioning would be. It wouldn't be all the players in the publishing market that would be interested in a specific business of that sort. Number four, consider the potential of the soft IP assets. So it's not always the registered ones that are most attractive. Sometimes they're the ones that are more non-obvious, that are more interesting, and the ones that competitors would like to get their hands on. Uh, that's, um, that's probably kind of the way to think about it. And last but not least, identify and highlight the main USP both now and in the next three years. Think about the future value. Uh, and the USP could be the multiple generation revenue generation channels. It could be the strong brand. It could be the great online presence or it could be the high quality content. Uh, but there's usually something there that makes it interesting and attractive. So, um, I will leave you with these five key takeaways and hopefully that's been an interesting experience for you and you find, found it useful and it will get you thinking about publishing businesses in a different way from now on. Um, what uh, we usually wrap up our uh, sessions with uh, is just a quick reminder that we have this IP asset checklist that has been specifically designed for uh, insolvency practitioners and following the webinar uh, we'll send you a link to the checklist so that you can take that print it off and take it to your next case uh, with some questions that you can ask and uh, a few boxes that you can tick tick so that you can see where this, where the situation is uh, and what the company might be. I think in the context of the publishing businesses, I would draw your attention to the other assets questions on the checklist, things about uh, what's held on the server and design work and things like that. So thank you very much for your time today. I will be wrapping up uh, now uh, in terms of uh, then our next sessions, we will be having one on the 10th of November that will be focused on pharmaceuticals and medical devices. And in December, we have our Christmas special, we have a Q&A session, uh, and I would encourage you all to um, submit your interesting, uh, wonderful questions that you have always wondered about in relation to IP that you think might be interesting to, for uh, other people to discuss as well. And we'll look to tackle them uh, to try and give you some interesting thinking points for Christmas time as well. Thank you very much uh, and have a good day. Thanks. Thanks. Wow.